my arm flew back and <laughs> came back and I was missing all three. These, the middle finger, they had to sew back on a couple times, and, but these were completely gone. All right, we're rolling. How you doing, Travis? I'm doing good, thank you. Thank you for being here, sir. Um, let's just start off, why don't you just introduce yourself, uh, just your name, uh, the branch of service you served with, uh, the years, and then the rank you got out. Well, my name is Travis Mayfield. I was with the Army, 101st Airborne. I was in Vietnam in 1967. 68, uh, I'm 100% uh, disabled. I was wounded in Vietnam. Mm, what, what rank did you get out? I came out as a corporal. Mm. And uh, so you were in from 67 to 68? That's correct. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> talk to me about uh, your, your childhood upbringing, Travis. Where, where, where are you from? Where were you raised? And what was your childhood upbringing like? Well, I was born in Long Beach, uh, California. I had great parents. Mm. My dad was a cop down in Long Beach with his brother. So it was a little tough uh, growing up in that family. He was uh, pretty strict, but it was good. I was one of those kind of guys that kind of defied him all the time. Mm. Um, I went to all my schooling in Long Beach, but uh, I kind of got in a lot of trouble down in Long Beach. Yeah. So. What kind of trouble did you get into? Well, I was stealing beer. <laughs> they had, um, I was always a pretty big guy, and they had the uh, trucking business or the beer business uh, went on strike, and I went and lied to them and started driving a beer truck at 16. Wow. And um, I was taking their beer, too. <laughs> So it's one of those kind of things. Uh, my dad, I loved him dearly. He, he was a good man, but I was uh, a little hard-headed growing up. And I got myself in trouble with some other guys uh, with, with the drinking. And so he made a deal with the judge uh, so I wouldn't have to go to jail to uh, send me in the military, make mm. me join. Mm. And that's what I did. Wow. And uh, that was what, like 67 or what year was that? That was in 1967. 1967. So it was something like, was he like either you go to jail or you go to the military type of deal? Exactly. Wow. Wow. And you chose the military. You picked the uh, army, right? I picked the army. Um, there again, I wanted to be with some guys, uh, cause I didn't care. I wanted to go fight. Vietnam was going on. And so I re up for an extra year mm. for three years to go into the 101st Airborne paratroopers. Mm. Wow. Um, and what was that like? What was that like for you before before you you end up getting yourself in trouble, and the judge giving you that option to go to the jail or the military? Did, were you having any thoughts of joining the military already? No, I went in under a buddy system with a friend of mine, and he was a little crazy. So he and I uh, we decided to uh, fight each other. And before we were ever inducted at uh, Fort Ord, California. Mm. But anyway, they pulled us aside and they said, you guys like to fight? And I said, yeah, we do. So they made us squad leaders. So mm. I never had to do KP duty or anything. They gave me 10 men. I made them do all the dirty work. <laughs> You guys got in a fight with what, like in basic training or something? Yeah, we fought each other. We used to fight each other all the time. Mm. 
So they broke up our fights and uh, we, uh, they just said, well, you guys like to fight that I'm putting you in charge of 10 men. We were squad leaders. He had a squad and I had a squad. Yeah. What was, uh, what was basic training like back then during that Vietnam era? Uh, back then it was good. All they did was prepare you for the next step, which I ended up going to Fort Augusta, where we did some ad additional training or fighting uh, in jungle training. They put you out there to live in the wilderness for a week and kind of learn to live off the land, mm. which is good. And um, went to Fort Benning, Georgia, and that's where we did our jump school. Mm. I was weighing about 220 when I first went in there, pretty solid. But when I finished jump school, I was weighing about 178. Wow. So I lost a lot of weight and just kind of being lean. Was that from like uh, doing a lot of PT during jump school or? You did a lot of PT and you did uh, every morning five miles of running. Mm. So every morning they get you up at, um, I think it was 5.30 or 6. Mm -hmm. And you go out and put your five miles in and then come back. Wow. And then get prepared to go jump. That's correct. <laughs> So uh, after you finished jump school, where'd you go from there? Well, there's about 200 in our group and they took two guys to go to Vietnam and I was one of the two. Wow. So I got separated from my guys. All my guys went to the 173rd Airborne. Mm -hmm. I went directly to the 101st in Vietnam. Mm. And so, uh, did you go to Vietnam right away after jump school or? Yeah, it, uh, it was pretty scary being 18, 18 years old. Uh, I didn't have anybody. I didn't know anybody at all. And so they put you right out in the line. We came in at, uh, uh, Saigon and then, um, uh, helicopters out to, which I went directly into the field. Mm -hmm. um, before going out there, uh, did you get the opportunity to speak to anybody that had maybe just come back or already was out there for a while, you know, to try to get an understanding of what you're getting yourself into? I didn't care. Mm. It didn't matter to me. I just... Um, like I said, I was pretty hard headed at that time and You're anxious to go fight. Yeah, I wanted to fight. So you get there and then um, you know, talk to me about what that tour was like for you uh in Vietnam, uh as an eighteen year old kid essentially, right? Eighteen years old, um and I do have to admit that jump school paid me an extra fifty dollars a month which I think I was making $92 a month to be part of the airborne. But once you're airborne, you get an extra $50 a month. And then I, um, I went to a demolition school, which was about a month, but that paid me a, another extra $50 a month. Mm. So I went for the money. <laughs> it sounds like nothing <laughs> today's money, but Back then, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, how many tours did you do out in Vietnam? No, I only lasted two months. Two months? Two months. I was put directly in the field. We were strictly search and destroy. You would burn a village down. You take um, the rice. You would take their food, ammo, anything you get your hands on. The only thing that was very displeasing to me was they'd pull you out after you took a hill and then the VC come right back in and take it back over. So it's like we were there, but not there to win it. Mm. Why would, uh, 
how how would they be able to take it back over? It would just they took it back over because they would dig themselves in. They would have like foxholes and they would dig themselves all the way under, uh, deep into the ground. Our bombs couldn't touch them. Mm. Your bombs could blow up on the hillside, but as far as take, taking those people out, uh, they were tough. They were mm. tough fighters. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> And I take it your tour wasn't uh, set for two months. What, how come you were only out there for two months? Well, because I worked demolition. And I worked booby trap mines. I was sent right to the field. And in doing so, i come across a booby trap mine, which is usually a Claymore mine that was our mines in their hands. And I would pull the detonating cap out of the mine so nobody would know that we were there, but a gook had set it off and blew my fingers off. So my arm flew back and <laughs> came back and I was missing all three. These, the middle finger, they had to sew back on a couple times, and, but these were completely gone. Wow. And then from there, what, they, they... From there, they put me over to, um, in Saigon, uh, they finally got a helicopter in to take, take us out of there. I was like in the middle of the VC and the Americans, they were fighting, I'm stuck in the middle. And I don't know how I got out of there. My partner did not make it, he was shot in the head, but I was thankful that I was still alive. Oh man. Your partner, um, were you guys pretty close? Yeah, not that close. I didn't know him that long. But, uh, and this may sound cold, but I was thankful it was him and not me. Mm. Um, wow. All hell was breaking loose at that time and, and he was already gone. I was a bloody mess. I didn't know it at the time. I had caught some shrapnel in my eyes and shrapnel in the stomach. Uh, they took uh, pieces of shrapnel from my stomach and then they worked on me in uh, Saigon. But I didn't know I had a middle finger and they pulled it up and I told him, save it, whatever you can do to save it, just save that finger. Mm. So they take, they sent me directly to uh, Japan. That's where they took in the amputees and people with serious head injuries went to uh, Tokyo, Japan. Mm. That's where they fixed you up? That's where I was fixed up. I had uh, a couple operations on the hand. I was also blind for six, uh, well, it was three months for each eye, but six months. Uh, I told him to do it all at once. Mm. And uh, I had shrapnel on both uh, the whites of the eye, not the color. And I wouldn't let him put me out. I had to stay awake to watch it. Ooh. And that's quite interesting. Wow. You stayed awake? You didn't want to be put under anesthesia? No. So you were awake? No, anesthesia, they froze my eyes. They, they shot me in the armpit yeah. uh, with needles and it would freeze it. Mm. But they would put clamps on and then I could watch them just come right down and oh. cut on the eye. So it's kind of a weird thing. But believe me, that when I tell you this, missing two fingers is nothing compared to people that lost their legs, lost arms. The scariest one I had, a guy next to me who lost all his face here except the tongue was sticking out. But these guys all had great attitudes. They all had good attitudes. They would go back and fight in a second. Um, I used to, in the hospital, I'd work in the hospital and I would, uh, a guy that lost his leg or legs, I'd pick their 
pick them up and put them in a whirlpool bath. They left their wounds wide open. My hand was left open uh, because of gangrene. Mm. Back then, they didn't mess with you. They just cut it off. I begged them to keep my middle finger on, which they did. And thank God I can still use it. So, mm. or it's only halfway. But so before you before you had that accident, um, uh, what was your day like? Were, were you know a typical day like in Vietnam? Were you guys getting in fights every single day? Or no, you travel from one area to the next. Uh, it was uh, how do you put it? Uh, the monsoon rains would hit. Um, you'd be cut up on the arms, would never heal. You were always have sores on you because uh, there was never dry time. It was always raining. Mm. And so, but you would go into an area and you'd just take over that area and you take the food, the rice, and you always had to be careful the little kids because they would uh, tape the little kids with grenades and the little kids would come up to the American soldier and if you paid attention to them or got close to them, they'd blow themselves up. Oh, wow. So you had to stay away from that. Oh, wow. Um, did you get in like to firefights out there? Uh, you said you would take hills and stuff like that. And they would take them back. Uh, how often would you get in contact with the uh, with the enemy? Usually, probably every three or four days, mm. and you would you would call for a gunship to with the coordinates to blow the area up, and then you go in there. But you see, the VC would still be there. Mm. So. Um. Any other any other stories about Vietnam? Uh, any member other memorable stories about being over there? Well, like I said, I'd r rather be hit early than to be hit late. Mm. Um, the guys that uh, all the people I know when they came in. They always had a, a good attitude, even if they lost their limbs, they, they were strong. They're not like uh, the pussies we have today. Mm. Sorry about that. That's all right, that's all right. <laughs> you tell it how you, how you feel it, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, do you have any, any memories, uh, you know, of being over there? Like any, any good memories of like maybe you, some of your, the closest guys or camaraderie that you built, uh, downtime that you had or any? I never got close to anybody. Really? No. There again, I was with 200 men, Fort Benning, Georgia, and there were only two of us that were sent overseas. And I was one of them. I never got to know anybody. I was always told, don't get close to too many people because you'll lose them. And that was true. Mm. So uh, I never got close with uh, my people there. Uh, next thing I know, I'm in Saigon Hospital. It never knocked me out when I, uh, I was probably in shock, but I was trying to when it cleared up, trying to pay people to find my fingers, I kept thinking I could put them back on. Mm. Dumb. Yeah. But, um, no, it was all good. Just the next six months, uh, I was in Japan. Yeah. In a hospital. So it took about six months to get your eyesight back. Yeah. Well, with the eyesight in the hand. Yeah. I actually converted over from right hand to left hand. Oh, really? I learned to do everything left-handed. Wow, really? Yeah, I would say the real venture, it's not so much Vietnam, but what happened after Vietnam. Mm. And that was always amazing to me. We came in at Travis Air Force Base 
and there was nobody to greet us, nobody to thank you for being over there. You were known as a baby killer. And Vietnam vets, like I'm wearing this hat right now. Uh -huh. Well, it's only been about the last five years that I'd wear any kind of a hat mm. or to show I was in Vietnam. But people are starting to realize now that you know, these guys did what was asked of them and... Yeah, so what was it like coming back from that, uh, you know, transitioning back into civilian life after that? Very difficult. Really? Very difficult. I got into drugs, I kept drinking. Things got pretty tough for me. Um, I got to the point where uh, I needed my own place. I made a deal with a management company to let me stay there. I worked as a janitor. I did whatever it took to keep my own apartment. My parents didn't want anything to do with me as much as they loved me, but it, it was hard to adjust. I also, um, I was taking care of a very good friend of mine. He was a machine gunner on a helicopter. And uh, that's why I donate this, that's an M60 machine gun on my arm. Mm -hmm. That's what he drove on my chest. I got a picture of a helicopter. And he used to blow the areas up, protect the American GIs. And uh, he got shot in the head and went just above his temple and came out above his eye. He was paralyzed. He learned to walk again, barely, half of his walk. Same with his arm. They had to put plates in his head. But I'd take him down to the VA. And I'm not trying to say bad about uh, the veterans. But the VA hospital back then in 1968 was a disaster. Mm. These guys were terrible. Really? They never knew what the problems were. All they do was drug you. Mm. Well, my friend finally took his own life. He killed himself. Mm. And in a way, I don't blame him. His life was just not worth a damn anymore. Yeah. So, but the VA has come a long ways. That's over 50, 50 years ago. And the only thing that saved me was dealing with another vet who grabbed me by the shirt and said, you gotta go to the VA. And I told him, I said, I already been there. They ain't worth a shit. He said, no, you gotta go. So he forced me to go. And he probably saved my life because I was just going downhill big time. And I got to learn and meet a lot of veterans with people, different programs they do. I still get very upset with the, um, with the doctors there only because you know which ones are there for the money mm. or which ones that are there that take care of the veterans. Mm -hmm. And that's what I look forward to. I deal with a lot of vets right now with PTSD and I work with them close to help bring them back into civilization. Mm. How old were you when you got back? I was, I was still 18. Still 18? Yeah. Wow. 19. 19? Yeah, I would have been 19. I was 18 when I went, 19. And you came back to Long Beach with your parents? Yeah. Okay. I came back with the parents, but then I had to move out because they couldn't put up with me. Mm. I was also married. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, I lost my wife. Mm. I've actually been married three times. Mm -hmm. I went through hell. And I've finally been able to pull out of it. And that's only because of veterans like this program right now, it helps you to be able to talk about it. Yeah. Is uh, the hell that you were going through, uh, was it all uh, like, 
you would say because of what happened in Vietnam, like just having to deal with that and trying to adjust to all that? It did because once I got back from Viet, in Vietnam, I don't know, I had structure, you know, go out there, take a hill, whatever you gotta do. Mm -hmm. But when I got home, I had nothing. I mean, I had a couple of women I was messing with. Mm -hmm. One I got married to and, oh my God. I, I was just in La La Land. Yeah. I had no, uh, the only thing that saved me was a Joe Martinez. Um, he, he used to be a, um, what do you call it, a tunnel rat. He'd go into tunnels and blow the VC up or make it safe for uh, <coughs> the American people to go into. Mm. But it's amazing what kind of holes they had that uh, the VC could build. Yeah. Wow. Um, so eventually, eventually, what do you think started helping you out the most? Did you start linking up with other veterans? Uh, how did you pull yourself out of that funk? I started pulling myself out um, by this guy told me to read this book, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Mm. And I really liked what it had to say about positive thinking. And so I started reading everything that I could. And then I started believing in myself where I didn't before, I'd just fight. And once I started that program, I've grown ever since. Mm. I'm a f firm believer in meditation. Mm. I'm a firm believer in reading positive thinking books. And it has helped me to grow better than I could imagine. Mm. And uh, what, what is, what's come from that? Like, let's talk about maybe, uh, you know, because you got a big entrepreneurial spirit, right? You got a lot of things going on. Uh, we, we talked the first time I met you. Um, let's talk about that and, 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 and how doing all this helps you uh, personally as well. I did property management for 30 years. When I first started, I begged the manager just to give me a job and I ended up cleaning floors and doing whatever I could. And I don't know, 19 or 20 years old, <coughs> I would, I started looking at the business and I had no idea what property management was. And I said, wow, I kind of like this. But I grew from there with positive thinking as a janitor to finally become an assistant manager. And then I worked my way up to become a manager. And then I became a supervisor. And I'd work 18 hour days, 20 hour days. I just kept going because I loved it. I, I would do things that uh, other people were afraid to do. When it came to collecting rents, I could collect rents. Mm. When it came to getting the job done, I'd get the job done. I loved it when somebody says, you can't do this or you can't do that. I'd always say, give it to me. Mm. I'll do it. Anyway, after 25 years in the business, I finally became the president of the company and I had over 5,000 apartments. Wow. And I did very well with that. Wow. And then I finally retired when I turned 50. Okay. And, but in the meantime, I was doing work with some chiropractors. And I showed them and the company how they could save a lot of money through workman's comp claims. Workman's comp, they're kind of a rip off because what they do is anybody that files a claim, they would just pay it. 
they never really investigated it. Mm. I would take people, I had 175 employees. I would take people that said they were hurt or had a problem, I would send them to the chiropractor, my guy. I paid my guy 20 bucks. I said, check him out, see if this guy's for real. If he's hurt really bad, I send him to a hospital and take care of it. If not, I let my chiropractor take care of him, pay him $20 a visit, get him back in the field. I save my company thousands of dollars every month. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's just a simple thing like that. And that's what moved me up in, in the company. Now, in dealing with the chiropractors, put together a small package for working out for people that can do exercising. Well, anyway, long story short, I've got a 12,000 square foot building now. I've got like three chiropractors, three massage therapists, a health food store. They do Taekwondo. 15 full-time trainers. And then in the middle of the gym, I've listed every flag you can think of. Mm. Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force. I put them right in the middle of the gym and I let everybody know that we have what we have today because of the people that have sacrificed their lives mm. to give us what we have. Mm. So my gym has been successful. I have to admit this COVID uh, kind of put the screws to me right now, mm. but nothing I can't get through. We'll yeah. get through it. Awesome. Is it starting to pick back up now that this pandemic's kind of dying out? It's picking up. It's slow. It's picking up. Um, so I have the gym. I go to work every morning, 2.30 in the morning. I don't have to work, mm. but I love what I do. I started another business, equine horse therapy. Mm. And I use that, I've made good connections with the Long Beach Veterans Hospital. And they're giving me an area where I can bring horses to the gym, where I can get veterans who can't get out of the gym, or not the gym, but the hospital, mm. to deal with the horses. Horses are a very relaxing, it's a beautiful thing to watch a horse work with somebody who's been injured mm. or somebody who has problems. Yeah. And all I want to do is to give back to the veterans with PTSD, people that are messed up in the head. I mean, it could be a policeman, a fireman. They go through hell. Mm -hmm. I work special deals out to get them into the gym to take care of their bodies and make them feel strong about themselves. But the horse therapy is one of the best things that could be done. So I stay busy. Yeah, sounds like it. Um, what is, what is uh, you know, does helping other veterans do, uh, you know, what does helping other veterans do for you? What it does for me is giving back. Mm. To me, life's about giving back. I'm sorry, you've got to, we have a wonderful place where we live in the United States. It's the greatest country in the world. I've been all over the place. There's nothing like the United States. And I served my time over there and I'd go back in a second right now. But what I'm doing is helping veterans that have no place to go. I'm working it out where I can get them to my gym help them to feel good about their bodies and what they are. The guy that runs my store, he's in a wheelchair. He works out in the gym by lifting his wheelchair. He's a bodybuilder. He's a, the guy's won many world contests as a bodybuilder in a wheelchair. And he got busted up in a car wreck. Mm -hmm. When I found out about him, I said, dude, I want you with me. Mm -hmm. So I've got a lot of different people this way. And anytime you can give back and make people feel better about themselves, 
or give them direction of what they can do and where they can go, it, it means everything to me. Mm. Mm. And what's the name of your gym? It's called Next Level Fitness and Wellness Center in Irvine, California. Mm. Awesome. Um, wow, that's awesome. Um, especially the horse therapy that you're talking about. Uh, I know you and I talked before and uh, I've been through some of that and uh, you know, the program died out because of funds, but uh, I a hundred percent, you know, that was helping me a lot, you know, training horses and breaking horses. So I'm pretty stoked about that because I go to the Long Beach VA and uh, you know, maybe I could go check it out when you get the horses over there. <laughs> Right now, I do have a lot of uh, top-notch doctors involved with me. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's kind of hurting me right now is, again, the money. You got to be able to have the money, so I'm looking for donations. Okay. Nonprofit organization. Um, not only that, I mean, I also take veterans that come from the Long Beach Veteran Hospital that would go directly uh, to our gym. And it's a beautiful thing. So, but the horse therapy is the most wonderful thing a guy can go through. Yeah. Do you know uh, how? Do you know about how much money you need to get the program up and going? I would probably say, of course, I'm always open to anything, but fifteen, twenty thousand. Yeah. Okay. You know. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I, I 100% believe in that program. Like I said, uh, I, was, I was going over here in Huntington Beach to the, uh, what is it, the equestrian center, or, you know, the stables. I didn't even realize they had stables here in Huntington Beach. Oh, they do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and uh, it was a military, the program was called Military to Mustangs, Breaking, and, breaking Mustangs, pretty much, Wild Mustangs. <laughs> yeah, so it was nice. Well, um, we don't need... I don't let veterans ride the horses until they're ready. It has to be authorized through a psychologist. Mm. So we'll take them through stages to learn how to groom a horse, to pet a horse, to work with them, maybe bathe a horse, um, learn how to walk them, move them around. And when they're ready, we will move them to the next stage mm. to be able to ride a horse or once a year, at the end of the year, I plan on going to Santa Barbara, taking a group of horses, a group of men, up there to that area, mm. so they can they can ride the horses then. Nice, that's a beautiful area too to ride a horse. Oh yeah, <laughs> Central Coast. Um, well, awesome, Travis. Uh, you know, we'll we'll start to wrap it up here. But uh, um, any any final words or anything else you'd like to get in before we wrap it up? The only thing I can say is that whenever you see a veteran, thank them for their service. Because they've really um, they put forth the effort to keep you alive and well here in the United States. People have sacrificed all their, what they do, you know, with the military. I just think it's important you let them know that you want to tell them thank you for what they've done. Mm. And there's a lot of people that are hurting out there. And that's my goal, my personal goal, is to reach those people and to help them out. Mm. There are a lot of vets that are still homeless. They haven't got a place to go. And whenever I can find them, even the Long Beach VA has some housing back there at the veterans and you can help them. So, and they'll fight you. They'll fight you tooth and nail. Mm -hmm. But don't give up on them. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, hey, thanks for being here, Travis. Uh, it's a huge contribution for you to come and uh, take the seat with Urban Valor and tell your story, man. Much, much appreciated. Thank you, sir. I appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no way I'm coming back home. 